So I want to thank you um, for joining us today, and I want to introduce to you our presenter, who did such a fabulous workshop for us on the masking ordinance a year ago. It seems so much longer. Um, we've invited him back to share his thoughts and expertise on dealing with the implementation of the vaccination card mandate. And we're going to allow him to introduce himself and tell us what he does and set the stage for the workshop today. Judd Haynes, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Arlene. And for everyone who's here, I am very excited. My head is swimming with a ton of information. So I'm going to try to be very methodical and and discuss some of the issues surrounding, uh, well, escalation and de-escalation, really focusing on that. Uh, yeah, I know there's been a lot of controversy here recently, uh, especially after the TDN article. Uh, most of it that I've received is about why people think I look so angry in that picture. Uh, and I don't have an answer for that. I didn't choose the picture. I, I assure everyone here, if they saw that, that is not my personality whatsoever for those that know me. Um, but, but again, there, there is, there is a lot of, um, and, and I'll get into this when, when I, when I start the slideshow, um, very strong feelings on, on all sides of this. And, and my goal here to be really clear is to really focus on de-escalation and not necessarily get into any like socio-political discussion, or I'm not a medical professional, like a doctor, a virologist, I'm not a legal scholar. So I, that's outside of my expertise. So, so if you know, there's any questions that, that can really pertain to uh, you know, how to really not only help, you know, in this context, employers and employees attend to people with really strong feelings about anything. And, and I think a lot of the, the uh, approaches that I'm gonna include in here are very generalized. I mean, none of these are specific to let's say a vaccine mandate. I mean, they're about how to engage with individuals who are, who are highly agitated or upset. So, so with that being said, I'm gonna do my best to kind of keep an eye on the chats and then go through some of the material. And uh, I think the last preface point I will make is rather than just showering everybody with de-escalation strategies, I try to bookend it with two things. One is some information about kind of what really leads to conflict and escalation. And on the other side is kind of self-care strategies on a kind of institutional level, which I found extraordinarily interesting. I'm secretly wanting to be an organizational, institutional organization psychologist eventually, but uh, my background is primarily clinical. Uh, private practice, and uh, here over the past two years now working directly with the Port Townsend Police Department. And so I'm going to share my screen and we will get started. And I hope that we will have plenty of time afterwards for any discussion, uh, questions, things like that. So, so my, my role at the Port Townsend Police Department is, is primarily to assist law enforcement with de-escalating uh, kind of high risk contacts or, or just any context regarding anything and everything. Um, interestingly, there's been a shift this year compared to last year. Most of my contacts, contacts are uh, people who have homes, who have jobs, uh, they're having kind of acute mental health or behavioral health crises and, and just helping them or their family members resolve them. Uh, another part of this, this role I really enjoy is, is Kind of working with community members, family members, discussing you know mental illness treatments, available treatments, um, options, and, and and just spending time understanding what they're experiencing. And uh, at the very end, I, I, I do thank some uh, specific organizations and individuals because as a mental health professional, I've worked with crisis before and I've had a lot of different roles, but working directly with uh, you know, first responders with law enforcement has given me uh, I, I just, just the, the experience of encountering situations as they're happening versus a day, a week, a month, six months later when someone seeks treatment. And I found it extraordinarily invaluable. So that's essentially my current role at the Port Townsend Police Department. So, uh, I had a colleague assist me. I, I created this over a course of a week. So I haven't given this presentation before. I, I try to tailor presentations to the group and 
from talking to Arlene, this was primarily around businesses, whether it be employers or employees, um, struggling with, with individuals who, who are going into their places of business really upset about you know, the vaccine mandates or mask mandates or, again, my goal is to discuss for any reason whatsoever. And so I had like six things in here and he was very clear that it's way too much and it's very confusing. So I'm just going to kind of keep it relatively simple and straightforward. So the first piece, and this is going to apply later, is for people to actually read and hopefully understand what the orders or mandates are. And really quickly, I'll just share an experience I had. We're going to a, a, an institution where they required someone to show proof of a vaccination and a bunch of conflict arose around it, not because they were, but they weren't individually against that. They had a vaccine card and they were willing to do it, but they wanted kind of a reason. They wanted uh, like, well, where's this coming from? And I want facts about this. And, and I think in some cases, whether it be few or many, simply having that information available uh, can, can sometimes help de-escalate a situation. And so this isn't part of the you know, de-escalation strategies, but, but I think it's very specific to um, what's going on right now and what can help uh, explain certain policies that businesses are required to follow and, and also explain to individuals who may be upset that here's what happens if we don't. And, and again, I, I, I have you know, no role specifically on pro or against any of this. It's simply um, making sure that the facts are available and hold on, my chat box went away. Second. Well, I want to move along. along. Ar Ar Arlene or someone else, uh, if they're able to look at chat, I'm unable to. Um, could you please just interrupt me? Um, I will do that, Jed. It's Arlene. Perfect. No Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, uh, for instance, there's an important piece uh, in, in the Washington State COVID facial covering guideline that that uh, was toward the end, and there's a lot of information in there, but that that if uh, an employee believes that a customer can pose a threat that they don't like they're not forced to engage and, and i'll talk a little bit later about well what do you do then um, so please review those so you know it's like well what leads to escalation and, and i think oftentimes the assumption is that someone who's really upset or angry regardless of the reason is kind of always that way and and that's definitely not the case and what i'm going to be focusing on is that sort of the the smallest or the kind of bottom tier, the interpersonal uh, individual family uh, co conflict in that realm. And there's three, right? So you have the institutional level and then you have uh, government, nations, things like that. And so this is where, well, what is, where does it come from? It's our beliefs, it's our attitudes, it's how we perceive things, it's what things mean to us, uh, our schema, it's, all, it's, it's if conflict arises from these places, and when we encounter someone where if they have a, uh, they're following a different belief system or something, it, it's it, it can be a hotbed of of, of a conflict. Because uh, I'm I mean I'm asked quite a bit, and and I'll share some of those experiences. Like, well, why did this, why did this person get so upset or angry about X? And the answer is pretty much always, if anyone asks me that, is it's complicated. And I think psychologists like to use the word, it's a multidimensional thing, which essentially means it's not one factor. Um, it's typically stemming from multiple factors. And, and I'm including this because one of the most significant problems I've encountered with people when they're encountering uh, someone who is very escalated is they often can take it personally and it can impact them deeply and for weeks, if not months from one experience. Um, so, so that's where I, I just wanna make it clear. It's, it's typically not just, I'm gonna go after a person and verbally be aggressive or anything like that. It, it, it stems from, I mean, it, it just innumerable factors. So uh, the other piece in here I have is about change. And toward the end of this presentation, talking about how positive change in any of these levels can influence the other and within a level. And one person, employee, employer, anybody who, who can make sort of a, a 
cause positive changes about how they respond to upset individuals, how they respond to, let's say, employees who have had a really tough time uh, trying to speak with someone uh, can make a significant change, reduce burnout, and a ton of other factors. And, and there's a, a, a lot of evidence to support that. So uh, probably, probably the most common question I think I'm asked sometimes is, well, how do we know someone's going to um, you know, be violent, physically violent in particular? I think that's, that's people's most significant concern. I mean, interestingly for me, and again, it's been about two years and we've had, I've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of encounters with uh, very agitated and upset people. I have never been physically assaulted. It's been close a few times, but, and, and that may be for a variety of reasons, maybe because law enforcement's right next to me and you know, a bunch of other factors, but it, it's not, I would say necessarily common if someone is very verbally agitated or being verbally aggressive that they're gonna resort to physical aggression. And reviewing recent research, it's pretty much the axiom is the same. It's it's the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So knowing that someone has a long history of being physically aggressive, they're likely to be physically aggressive. And 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 the reason I'm including this is I think being afraid and being fearful that hey this person may begin to assault me can really inhibit um, using specific kind of de-escalation skills. It really prevents Kind of those higher cognitive functions of being aware, being adaptive, and responding to what's actually happening because self-preservation is a very powerful force and uh, fear can, can really override a lot of systems. Um, and, and I include that, that there's, you know, in, even in controlled environments, there's no real clear, like here's direct causes for people to become aggressive uh, or anything like that. So. So we'll see. I mean, I, I, as they continue to investigate aggression and violence, perhaps there will be some clarity. But for now, it's kind of like, well, why is there conflict? There's a ton of reasons why. Uh, I'll be very brief with this one. And I emphasize the word personality traits. Uh, and I hope no one here looks at these traits and then compares these traits to people they know in their life. Uh, that's not my intention. My intention is that some research, and this is about 10 years old now, saying like, here's some features, personality types, and, and this isn't situational. So a lot of people who are upset about a very specific issue, it, it's, it's a departure from their normal functioning. That's not a trait for individuals who are consistently antagonistic or impulsive, uh, mean, um, disconnected, unemotional, uh, and I threw substance in there, it's not a trait, but that's, that can be a wild card as far as uh, disinhibit, disinhibiting someone's um, like executive functioning, things like that. Uh, and the reason I'm including this is to make it clear that uh, the majority, uh, I really rarely use absolutes, so close to all, nearly all the individuals I contacted don't possess these traits like in perpetuity. Uh, it, it's it's very situational, and and for me to be aware of that because uh, that means approaching in a certain way can help kind of move them from that space to a space where we can actually hopefully uh, be somewhat productive and, and communicate. So, uh, how do we address conflict? So, I you know I I, I do all of these. Okay, to be clear, it's not like you start at avoiding and level up to problem solving or that you're in problem solving all the time. I mean, there's parts of my professional life and personal life where, where I may avoid uh, certain things. And I, I got the chat back up. Sorry, so I can take a look at this. Uh, but I think it's really important to, for people if they're going to be in positions where they're going to be in contact with individuals who are occasionally going to be highly upset to be aware of well what's another you know, common theme like typically if someone comes in they're really upset i run to the back or or i try to control I am that muted. situation in a, okay. in a in a forcing type manner or just say okay i'll whatever you want is fine uh and, and, and just yield to the individual and every circumstance Yielding may be the most appropriate approach, um, but but to 
to really understand that uh, as individuals, we're gonna respond very differently to different uh, intense scenarios, uh, emotionally intense scenarios. And I, I think the best way to really kind of hone in on that is to practice. And I know it can be pretty awkward. I, you know, in, in my work, practicing I don't know, clinical skills can be a little strange. It helps if I don't know the person a little bit, but, but where if there's the ability to practice in a safe way, in a realistic way for people to encounter these scenarios, uh, that can be extraordinarily helpful and kind of help people in a non-judgmental way say it's like, yeah, I really just want to avoid all this to understand why and to be able to hopefully kind of work through that so they can be uh, effective employees or individuals and not kind of carry these uh, conflicts with them in their daily life as they move along. Okay, so essentially the goal of de-escalation uh, and, and I really like uh, our Andor and Hutchins' uh, definition of this is to help move someone from a high state of tension to a low state of tension. That's it. It's not to resolve all their problems. It's not to, you know, I don't know, debate any particular topic. It, it's, it's responding to an emotional event. And um, I think the most I'll probably say this about every single one of these, but I, I think one of the most important uh, uh, approaches as far as de-escalation de is concerned is someone's attitude. And I gotta move it. Sorry, everyone, I gotta move the chat box here. I have to keep doing this. There we go. And what you know, what I mean by this is is a, an appropriate attitude based on the situation. And and I think. For some people, if it's like anytime there's conflict, I'm going to approach it really aggressively. That sort of attitude, uh, body language, and everything is going to be pretty clear to the individual who's very highly emotionally upset, and and it's just going to feed off of that. Uh, I, I right, be personable. It's like please don't be robotic and run through a script, um, because I think they can be aware of that and feel like they're not really being talk to by an actual person but the attitude with which we approach a situation and there's been some cases where uh, i've been with law enforcement and they've been i've taken a step back just because they're just in a, in a much more i would say congruent state of, you know along with that person to to respond to them and to what's upsetting them and, and to help de-escalate it simply by their presence and, and for situations I've been as well, just sometimes just giving off like, hey, I'm here, I'm paying attention, but I'm not gonna reflect what they're reflecting back to me. Um, that, that'll typically exacerbate things and, and, and make them worse. So um, yeah, continue appropriate attitude. So it's gonna be exhausting and I'll talk about that at the end. And this gets into sort of industrial, organizational, psychological world. Stuff, which there's overlap with mine, but we're talking about the difference between like surface acting and deep acting. And if anyone's interested in, in those things, please look them up after this presentation. But surface acting is like employees who their job is to be friendly and courteous, um, like a thing like a barista. I mean, they have to you know, smile a lot and be thankful and just sometimes put up with you know, people crossing boundaries or saying inappropriate things, things like that. And that can be extraordinarily exhausting. Um, and then there's kind of deep acting where they can be connected to those experiences with, while still uh, operating between, you know, very appropriate lines as far as uh, kind of responsibilities and roles are concerned. And, uh, you know, I found that, that, that professionals and even colleagues of mine who have had uh, very combative clients can, can get really exhausted because sometimes they think like, I have to pretend that um, you know, this doesn't get to me and things like that. And, and that, that can definitely wear on someone. So body language is, is significant. Uh, I, I think what concerns me most when going to a scene is if the person who is really upset is surrounded or has four people like talking to them at once. Uh, even if I'm in a really calm state, that would make me anxious unless maybe you're an extrovert and really like that. But 
being aware of the, the scene is critical and how someone's talking. So I tend sometimes to talk pretty quickly. So I'm having to make a concerted effort to speak a little more slowly, make sure the tone of my voice isn't too loud or like it's short and sharp and because I'm feeling agitated. So I want them to know I'm agitated that that, that will typically make things worse. So next slide, Sorry. manually we go. So as I said before, the, the real primary objective is to de-escalate um, and, and then if possible, address the concerns, the problem, what is really the, the individual's primary concern. And you know, I mentioned this briefly, but the impaired cognitive functioning is typically temporary. And for someone and for people to think back on their own lives, like when they have, let's say, sat with someone who is distraught, not just you know a little upset or kind of saddened by something, but truly distraught at, at, at a loss, let's say, um, sometimes the best thing to do is just sit there with them because it's such a highly and intensely emotional state that, that higher level cognitive processes and problem solving processes aren't really functioning essentially. And, and, and it just sometimes takes time to move through that to where they can kind of think a little clearer. So this is where I, I put in things like try, and I love metaphors and analogies. So it can be really hard for me, but keeping things relatively clear uh, statements, simple, direct, to the point, uh, can sometimes be uh, highly helpful. So for instance, um, and sometimes I repeat, repeat myself and saying like, so what can I help you with right now? Like what is concerning you most right now? And I add that well, time, you know, time oriented word there right now because it's like, hey, what bothers you the most all the time? It, we're not gonna really get anywhere. And so by really focusing on, on the very present moment, what's their greatest concern right now can help me get a sense. And if they're able to reflect that and communicate that with me, that's pretty good. When people aren't and it's just, it's, it's just straight emotional material coming at me, we're not gonna really be doing any problem solving. So please keep that in mind. Uh, I, I love, Certain like fallacies and things like that, and one of them in particular is the, the you know the misdirection, and it's kind of bringing in other issues that aren't really about what's happening in the moment. And I, I've a few times been caught up in this, and in the thing, uh, the term I use, uh, I didn't come up with it. Is a colleague of mine did is it's like I, I know I'm in that state where I'm like chasing my tail. I'm all over the place because it feels like I'm in a maze and not like a fun corn maze or anything, but like a really unpleasant, like I, I have no idea what's happening. And that's a good reminder for me, at least in these situations to pause and then just come back to it's like, okay, what what is what is bothering you the most right now? What is your most significant concern? And just to return to that place. And, and so I think, again, for me, that biggest way to do that is like, well, what state am I in? If I'm really confused, I'm in the maze. And um, I think teenagers are really good with that with their parents is confusing them and getting them all kind of turned around. So, so if any of you have children or teenagers or at least, you know, definitely were a teenager, uh, can probably relate to that and um, hopefully not get caught up in that. So here's, um, a, a, a relatively, I think, straightforward approach is, uh, I think once things go to an argument, um, and by argument, I mean, it's, it's here's information and I'm gonna attach a, a lot of emotional content to it and try to deliver it to you. It's gonna be met with defensiveness. It's gonna, some people are gonna be extraordinarily guarded. Uh, I don't really like, love the term explain the situation because if I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to explain this to you, kind of can be a power differential there that, that some people may not like. But being able to provide information to explain the specific situation, whatever it may be, can um, kind of help at least provide the information that, that, that can interrupt 
let's say a, a typical exchange. I think for some people who are used to, like I'm gonna be really agitated and go out into the world and people reflect that back to me, it, it, there's a lot of power there and that can be pretty satisfying for some individuals. So for someone on the receiving end to say, it's like, hey, I'm happy to provide you information about you know, why this is our policy. For instance, I know the Jefferson County, uh, the, or Port Townsend Library, uh, has a shared space policy, and I think that may be throughout the city or the county. Um, I, I'm not really clear on that, but the shared space policy is really clear, and I really like that because they're able to review that specific document. Like right now, here are expectations, and it's not like they're not made up. People are like, I don't really know if you can do that or not. It's it's relatively clear, and I think it, it helps ground a lot of situations. And fortunately, I haven't. I've only been there recently one time on a call, but uh, it, it fortunately resolved without you know any significant outcomes. But but being really clear about, and that's why I, I included the I know what any current orders are or rules, things like that. Um, so if if there's alternative solutions, let's say at the restaurant, it's being able to offer those, it's like, like we, you know, well, here's what we can do. Uh, if they're unable to be seated or anything like that, is, is if there is an alternative option offering that, and if it's refused, move on. Um, if, if it's appropriate to use humor or kind of joke about things, great. Um, that's, you know, it, it, so much of this is driven by people's personality. So I, I think, you know, along with, you know, someone's attitude, it's about being authentic. Uh, but still being kind of professional and maintaining kind of control of themselves and awareness is, is being really authentic in those situations, which I think can help, you know, be adaptive and adjust. So if someone does start kind of slowing down a little bit or de-escalating is shifting a little bit, then maybe getting more information, uh, being able to communicate things like, hey, would you be willing to, so, so I keep your concerns private? to speak over here where, where it's a little less public but some people may want to make it public right and if they refuse okay adapt and adjust hey judd we yeah. have a question in the chat about um it just steps back a little bit here about can you elaborate on why to avoid metaphors and analogies oh, sorry i missed that so i i uh you know, I, I think you know, I, I typically resist that because, as I said, I really like using them because it helps paint a picture for what we're talking about. And without pulling out my neuropsych book, it, it's it's where if someone is really highly escalated, um, parts of their brain are going to be more active than others. And so our use is, you know, as human to use analogies or metaphors to describe certain topics or subjects can help people really conceptualize them well. But someone who is extraordinarily escalated may have trouble doing that. It may not make sense to them. It, it may seem like, you know, in some cases, it's like, well, you know, what are you talking? What are you talking about? Like that is, that's that doesn't make any sense. And they're all they can also be kind of culturally different and based. So someone coming from a different state or a different country uh, may not make sense in that. And that's where it's avoid them if appropriate. But some people it, it may be appropriate, and that's where. I wouldn't say never use analogies or metaphors. I, I, I think it really depends on the situation. Um, but again, I, you know, I think the reason I'm including that is if you try to convey really complex ideals to someone who is very upset, they're typically not going to absorb all of it. And that's where it's like first trying to assess how, cogn how, how cognitively intact are they? Are they upset, but still very organized and kind of thoughtful? Then yeah, then, then an analogy may be great. Um, so, so hopefully that kind of answers your question. I think a lot of my answers are gonna be, well, it depends, but I will try to give specific information. So you. there's one more question that's yeah. popping up more than once, and that's about the shared space rules. Um, we can't find them and would love to know more about them, I think is basically the answer. Great. I would, um, I guess, recommend. I don't have them available right now. I don't, but 
We'll it's, source them out and send it yeah, to I, everyone. I think if you could it, just the, explain the it a little bit. Okay, it's been about a month since I reviewed them. Uh, it's it's the shared space policy is just a policy about um, acceptable behavior. Um, it, it's positively oriented, so it's not just about like negative outcomes. Like if it, you know you're loud, we're going to kick you out, kind of thing. But it's more the the spirit of how they would like the library and the community within the library to operate. And so I, I want to give specific, like here's one, two, and three, because I can't recall them off the top of my head. Looks like someone may have found it, I think. Uh, attachment space, share the space program, or share the space. Uh, I, I just know that when I have arrived to the library, that's sometimes my first question. It's like, were they able to review this? Or what kind of what are they violating right now? So if I need to talk to someone about it, it's like, hey, here's the policy of the library. Um, and, and right now we're, kind of not really following this one and, and try to at least, like make a connection around that. And, you know, the big part of that too is, is kind of boundaries of acceptable and appropriate behavior. And I think that that moves through and cuts through you know, rules that even I disagree with, let's say that are out there. I mean, there's, there's, ton of even like laws and regulations that overlap and contradict each other, but that there are definitely um, kind of boundaries around, you know, appropriate and acceptable behavior. And, and, you know, so far, at least, I appreciate it. Everything is, seems to be civil so far is even having really strong feelings about anything, but being able to communicate them civilly and even say, hey, I disagree with this and pursue a course of action around that. Wonderful, excellent. And, and I've helped people who felt that um, an organization has been unjust or that even I have to provide them uh, uh, ways and methods to express their their dissatisfaction, I suppose, in a productive way. So, so yeah, it looks like it's been posted. So awesome. Uh, I'll make sure I scroll down. So uh, this is, uh, you know, I'll defer to, to specific law enforcement agencies around this. And, and because I, you know, I get asked questions, well, what if we do everything we can in the best way possible to help deescalate a situation and someone is not deescalating or they're even becoming more agitated or angry and refusing to leave. And, and this is where I think, you know, the first step if possible, I don't want to inund inundate them with phone calls, but is to communicate for like a business to communicate with an officer or sergeant, lieutenant, chief of police, whatever's appropriate. Say it's like, hey, uh, what would be helpful in situations where we typically feel like we need to call law enforcement? Like what information is helpful to pass along? Um, and, and I think for at least my experience with the Port Townsend Police Department, it isn't to arrest people or get people in trouble, but it's to resolve these situations in a way to where the, the business, as well as the individual who's upset can get kind of the services they need um, when, when appropriate. And so where I think this becomes problematic and you know, I think it, for the most part in poor towns and people have called and, and provided really great information that I think is helpful in, when responding to these calls. They're saying like, here's the situation, we've been trying to communicate about a policy or here's the behavior around someone or someone's been trespassing and uh, you know, we, we need a law enforcement response is communicate information uh, because there's been some calls where I'm, I, can see the 911 calls coming in and it's, I can almost <clears throat> sense the panic in them. And there's not a lot of information and it's typically, it's, it's, it seems like a ton is happening. And oftentimes when we arrive, someone's definitely upset, but it's not the mayhem that it seems like that, that the call seems to be about, right? So um, by practicing certain skills, I'll be getting into a little bit, it can help at least gather information. So if it does get to that point, um, there may be other options than law enforcement can utilize. They can, if I'm not on duty, they can actually call me and I can maybe be helpful or, or they, they can approach it in a way versus showing up and just trying to figure it out. 
based on based on a really frantic or hurried call. But you know, I think the best best approach too is to develop a relationship with law enforcement. I um, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to get into this role is to work within a police department, which which has been very eye opening. Uh, but uh, yeah, so so please check in with your local law enforcement agencies about sort of their policies around stuff and, and what they need. Okay, employee protective factors. So I gotta move all these things around. Here we go. Uh, it, I know this all seems like common sense, but at least I like to provide some you know, support from uh, you know, some evidence-based support around this stuff is that employees who have organizational support, like the, their managers, employers, or whoever, um, listen to their concerns, try to address their concerns, uh, far less emotional exhaustion than, than the other situation where employees are kind of left to their own devices and they have a job to do and they do it the best they can and then they leave and there's kind of a disconnect. Um, and, and it's really about perception too. So some of some, let's say institutions may say, oh, we provide all these services, but there's a huge gap and somehow those services connecting with the employees. Uh, and, and this is all really stemming from a conversation Arlene and I had with maybe like a lot of younger employees, late teens, early twenties, uh, who may not have, this sounds like an insult, it's not like the emotional intelligence based on experience, that's where that comes from, just lived years that let's say older employees may have as, as far as their perceptions of things, how they respond to conflict and that kind of stuff. And so organizational support can be extraordinarily helpful. Uh, the, the next large bullet point here, as far as assisting employees um, with uh, kind of after, after a conflict or an experience is the key word here is positively reappraising. I mean, I've, in most places I work, it's kind of gallows humor sometimes, or it's kind of a dark way to respond to unpleasant events where sometimes uh, the, the you can kind of be harsh on the individual that, that we had an encounter with, which generally can not necessarily be that helpful. Uh, it, it may be sometimes, but this is where this is a little different. And that is rather than saying, here's what's likely wrong with this person, or here's why this person did this, and you know, here's all these negative attributes about them is really focusing on the person that was in that situation and to identify it's like here's you know how do you think it went here's what went well uh is there anything that can be improved upon i mean really not making it overly complicated but to reappraise it in a at least neutral if not positively oriented way um, other things that research has found to be really helpful to Mitigate burnout is providing short breaks after, let's say, atypical encounters. And what that was found to do was create some empowerment and to allow for some emotional regulation following something. Because make no mistake, if, if I just leave the house and have a very intense encounter, it's like my emotions are going to be dysregulated somewhat, even if I'm able to appear kind of calm and everything else. And so by taking even just a few minutes uh, to to do really basic things and, and like you know, just some some simple breathing exercise to orient myself to time and place like you know it's parts of like DBD DBT kind of strategies like what you know what are some things I see smell you know all those like what is happening right now versus kind of getting lost in my thoughts or into that situation and just ruminating about it. So, so those are a couple of ways employers can be really helpful. Next is, and I am not an expert in this more organizational psychology. If anyone knows any organizational psychologists, please use them. Um, they're they're amazing people. Um, but health specific leadership, it's just where there is an awareness of in health, physical, mental. I mean, holistically, that that, that there there is awareness that. It, you know, it exists and that it's relevant. And what I really found interesting about some of the research I reviewed is um, that, that how much influence employers have regarding uh, the, the 
the health of their employees, right? And, and how they present what's what what they express as being important to them, their behaviors can definitely trickle down uh, to to those that work in a specific uh, organization. So, and, and again, it's it's there was a very clear uh, association, positive association between more health specific uh, behaviors from employees and less burnout um, or increased retention. Um, so I, there's a question on here. Can you share about toolbox for regulating your emotional distress, breathing, et cetera? So <clears throat> I, th there are so many resources around this. Um, I, I, I think the longer I've done this, the more I found it, it needs to be kind of individualized. Uh, some people already have some healthy coping strategies that they use, uh, I think maybe without even being conscious of them, but being able to really uh, kind of clarify what they are and what's helpful to them. I mean, they may be more kind of actions, like some people like baking or whatever, but, but consciously doing that um, in the moment, breathing is huge. I mean, that's a way to interrupt, I think some neurological symptoms that saying like, oh my gosh, this is really dangerous or risky. We got to ramp up. But by being able to consciously maintain even breathing, uh, and I think uh, there's so much out there. Uh, one I like is sort of the square breathing method. So it's like three to five seconds, uh, breathing in, holding three to five seconds, breathing out, holding, and then repeating that. It's, I, I try to keep it simple because there's some that it's like, it's all over the place and it's more meditative, I think, uh, which, which is great. But in situations where I got to really be thinking and adapting and adjusting, maintaining that even breathing, uh, I, I think really helps my brain kind of stay focused and and not kind of trip into uh, you know fear, anxiety, and, and and those kind of emotional states. I think I mentioned some more here in the next slide. We're almost to the end. Oh, yeah, we're almost to the end. Okay, so other strategies. Uh, communicating. Uh, so, so, so this is where uh, what, one of the things I mentioned a few slides ago was kind of positive reappraisal. You know, after an event, sometimes like I don't want to talk about it. Let's just move on. But, but sometimes aspects of it can get stuck in in, in memory. And I'm not suggesting that this will lead to some sort of um, uh, I don't want to let's see pathological. Uh, or diagnosable mental illness, but but it, it, it can definitely, I mean, significant enough stress over a long period of time will have an effect. And so ways to acknowledge that that stress exists and, and either talking about it with people uh, and, and, and getting a bigger picture. So one strategy that has been really helpful is sometimes people in intense situations just see a, a piece of it. They don't really see the kind of where, how it started and the outcome. And so in situations where they can kind of get a bigger picture and realize that it's not, it wasn't about them necessarily, or they weren't some sort of linchpin in an event can really help kind of take them off the hook. And, and if they feel really guilty, like, oh, I should have responded better to that. It's, well, knowing what we know now and having a lot more information perhaps, but how do we, Kind of include that knowledge in a productive way versus in a well i'm going to avoid this because i had an unsuccessful de-escalation attempt i mean i've had tons where i just look at an officer it's like there's nothing i can do here i mean it, it, generally those cases are substance related where someone is so floridly psychotic uh verbal de-escalation is just not going to happen uh if up at, the, at those situations, the best we can do is kind of nonverbal presence and come up with a plan that's safe for everybody. Uh, so I'm trying to think of any kind of relatively straightforward ones. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think after a response like this, avoiding, you know, any stressful situation, avoiding alcohol, um, trying to just eat healthy, drinking plenty of water, I mean, really basic things because stress and stress hormones, they're gonna go all throughout the body and processing those as efficiently as possible is going to help someone recover much, much faster. 
uh, and I'm not saying don't drink, uh, but I think don't drink excessively uh, is, is something I'd strongly recommend. And I, I have to say this because it's my profession, I guess, it's like suppressing it and saying it doesn't matter. It'll find a way out eventually. Um, so I think I definitely want to leave, I know we only have a few minutes left, but I, I quickly, if you'll bear with me, uh, want to thank, I have to thank the one-tenth of 1% 1 board, the Behavioral Health Advisory Committee and the City of Port Townsend. They have fortunately uh, funded my position, which I'm really grateful for, MCS Counseling. Uh, they, who I'm contracted with, uh, allow me to do this work. And the Port Townsend Police Department continues to let me in after two years. So, you know, that's always a good sign. And uh, Chambers of Commerce, and then a colleague of mine, Will Williston Riggs, who reviewed, uh, this was about twice as long and got into stuff that I think people would have been scratching their heads around. So so he helped me kind of really cut this down and and hopefully, some of the information in here was helpful uh, to some of you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, I have my contact information there. It's my work cell and my email. If anyone would like me to elaborate on anything I discussed or to discuss any aspect of this, uh, please feel free to contact me.